Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers and I'll be your host for today. Just a few points of logistics and then a brief bit of context for, before we begin our session. Uh, we will attempt to field any questions at the end of our session, so please submit them using the GoToWebinar toolbar on the right side of your screen. This session is also being recorded, so you can look for an email from me uh, within 24 hours after the session ends, uh, which will include a link to the recording. Now, a bit of context for today's presentation. This is part two in a series that is a little bit outside of the traditional Lean Frontiers webinar, as there's a specific software program tied to the message. But we're bringing this to you today because, as our company name indicates, Lean Frontiers, uh, we are always exploring new frontiers of good business practices. And the thinking behind this tool uh, is what truly interests us. It's uh, paradigm shifting thinking. Our presenters today are going to be Doc Hall and uh, Bill Adams. Um, so brief introduction of both these gentlemen. Uh, Doc Hall is one of the original pioneers of lean thinking, having written the book uh, Zero Inventories back in 1982. It's also a founding member of the Association for Manufacturing Excellence and is founder of the Compression Institute. You'll also hear from Bill, who developed the QPS tool that we're uh, going to be kind of centered around the conversation. He began his career with a 12,000 hour tool and die apprenticeship. In his past, has worked with uh, GE in a one year feasibility study of advanced manufacturing and later purchased an aircraft. Uh, ground support equipment company. Both of these descriptions for both of these gentlemen is very short synopsis of a storied set of careers. So for now, uh, Doc, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and let you take it from there. Okay, thanks, Dwayne. And uh, well, as Dwayne indicated, both Russ and I are not exactly babes in the woods with manufacturing. And I've known Bill for, oh, I don't know, maybe five years or a little more, batting around off and on about what he's done and what he's been doing. He's developed the ideas behind QPS based on his own use of it for around 30 years, starting with something very fundamental and adding bells and whistles. Uh, yeah, there's software. What's interesting is a, a very different look at the connect between uh, finance and operations. So let's get started with that. <clears throat> Bill, chime in a little bit. First, about Bill and I were not really consultants, not accountants. I don't think I ever really consulted personally. Uh, we are from operational experience uh, and you can read that cartoon for yourself you know that's a cartoon about consultants uh, what's interesting or unique about quality profit science or the system well it ties the financial performance to operations it's not trying to direct operations with financial measurements uh, the, the key idea is equivalent dollars, and we'll get to that. The second key idea is that you plan or engineer your profit as a target, and you guide everything that happens from that. So this is not a real new cartoon, but uh, first I ask you to rethink inside the box, your box. That begins to help you think outside the box. Box meaning your company, of course. So what are equivalent dollars? Well, they relate to or touch six points. And you can see the little box with a star in it. That's the profit pricing specification. That's the target to hit. And it touches on the six points that you see. Quality, on-time delivery, etc. Uh, in other words, 
this is a kind of program that stimulates you to do an awful lot of what you ought to be doing anyway. Whoop. We went too far. What's equivalent dollars? Well, they drill down by drilling up. <clears throat> In other words, you start from the profit, the target profit or the planned profit that you want, and then you go kind of reverse to conventional thinking, and you develop the monetized checkpoints that every activity on a value stream or a path has to hit in order to attain that planned profit. If you're straying off, the system will tell you. You got a good visibility plant where people paying attention will know that some problem is developing before they ever see it in the system because you got to report to the system. But if it does report to the system, everybody knows it. And fourth point down, this is total company system. <clears throat> All activities from where an order may even be conceptualized all the way to putting it in finished goods or shipping it, everything is on what Bill calls a planned profit path. <coughs> so that's a little different. This is not exclusively a shop program, and that's, in my mind, one of the beauties of it. One of the weaknesses of most of the three-letter terms for improving a company is it's pretty easy for senior management to delegate it to operations or somebody else and say, here, uh, you make this work and we're, we're waiting on the reduced cost or whatever, whatever it is to come out of it. And the result of that is the more things change, the more they stay the same and flavors the month. And, you know, I think you're familiar with, a, with that merry-go-round. Once you're on the system internally, all the financial numbers are expressed in equivalent dollars. That is, you, you don't need you don't need cost accounting and accounting variances and various other ways to try to run things. This does it. Say, Doc, Bill here. Yeah. We missed slide five. Maybe you want to go back to that. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, <clears throat> this just builds on QPS being a total company system. So the financials you use for guidance project outward from that planned profit. Those projections are in equivalent dollars. That is, dollars that are equivalent to the profit you wanted to get. You set that up when you take orders in. And so the, the system will guide you. It's up to you what profit you want. If it's zero, you can set it at zero. Most companies don't want to lose money, but you can be aggressive in how much you want to get, or you can be fairly modest, or, you know, that's that's up to the management to guide that. But once you set your price, that creates the equivalent dollars. And the equivalent dollars that come out really match what you can do right now. Yeah, you get a little advanced, you may think about learning curves or something, but you're setting up an order that you should be able to make and hit the planned profit with what you can do right now, today. Uh, you use the system to keep improving on that. That's great benefit of it. Bill calls this capital free profit. Just like with anything else, if you can increase the productivity, if you can get more stuff out of the same people and equipment, then you're releasing capacity. And so you may get some benefit even if you don't release capacity, but 
when you infill sales to the new newly released capacity, that's when you get the afterburner on this and the profit begins to really sail compared with the, with where you used to be. Doc, you can all, yeah. What happens? That dollar will in that infill sale will bring fifty two cents to the bottom line. That dollar. Yeah. Capital-free profit. Yeah, the, 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 Bill is speaking from his experience with it. <clears throat> In addition, that third bullet from the bottom, you, the perspective you get on what you do, the ability to structure orders to to more formally understand what you can and can't do. When you're talking with a customer, you you have a since you know more about what you can do you're able to be a lot more forthright in negotiating with them. And a time or two in the past, Bill's found that to be an advantage, that, yes, you can do what you say you can do. Number two, if you can't, can we adjust, man, blah, 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 get something that we can do, and or if we can't find work that our current process can handle, what do we have to do to equip ourselves to get the kind of work people want us to do. Uh, now last, this is an internal operation system. It's strictly internal. External reporting of financials is with a conventional gap uh, financial accounting. <clears throat> this does not interfere with that. It, it feeds back and tells gap what it wants to know when you know as as work is completed and. However you deal with that is up to you. And as I mentioned earlier, Bill's been fiddling with this thing, having success with it for about 30 years now. Skip that one. This is a 30,000-foot look at the system. <clears throat> Maybe the next webinar where Bill will show a few screens, if you want to dive down into that and get deep in the dirt, Bill will take you there. But it's pretty much confusing without kind of having an idea how the whole thing goes together. And Bill's kind of a system thinker. It's not one piece, one piece. They're not separated. So out in the backlog where you see orders coming in, well, you have some that are pending, and you run it through the process, and then they're accepted, and that acceptance is by a profit coordinator, which may be strictly virtual, but you could have somebody that does that that's a profit coordinator. Accept and reject orders, and once they're accepted, they're scheduled. Then you go to the next block, you block schedule hey, orders. Doc, Doc, yeah. Bill, that... Profit control coordinator is scheduling profit, not parts, and then attaching the correct amount of parts and level loading plant capacity of every person to support it. Another key idea in this is that block that says box schedule orders. So they break up orders. You try to to set it up so that you get as good a flow through a plant as, as you can get. And the system helps you do that. In addition, you can run the, the system as in simulation mode or just look at what's there, look at what problems you're going to have. And uh, besides pricing to the plan profit, you and anticipate that you're going to have a quality problem with this one or a tooling issue with that one or whatever it is, and get set to run next week, this week, next month, this month, all that. And the profit assurance system, that's tracking. Monitors pretty much real time. Flags problems, yellow, red. Uh, something goes yellow or red, somebody ought to be all over it. And it tracks, it's tracking your planned profit. It's tracking those dollar equivalent dollar representations of the planned profit. 
you had all the markers, you ought to get the money out of that order that you thought you were going or, or targeted that you, that you were going to get. And Doc Bill again, the profit assurance system projects from the front of the company. We call the bow wave. It is not run from the behind. It actually is from the future. It's a full pull system. Uh, this screen is another oh, perspective on the same thing. So over on the left-hand side, you've got descriptive analytics. Everybody's kind of familiar with that. You're not projecting as much from your past as you might with a forecast because you go way out to the right side. What's the predictive analytics? And so... Bill refers to a profit schedule. Once you bring in orders and they're accepted, it's sitting there. Somebody in finance can say, that's the planned profit coming in and for a week, a month, two months, whatever it is. This is the money, the profit that's going to come into this. Of course, that depends on how well you execute, but, but it's in practice has worked pretty well. In the middle of that's prescriptive analytics, uh, and that's the, you know, let's just call them the yellow and red lights. These are the, the, the tracking part of the system that tells you you got a problem here, you got a problem there, or you're going to have a problem. So let's go on. Well, that's terribly new to anybody. So this is company-wide, now this is an operational company, operational finance. And so uh, you'll, you'll learn that Bill has his own language for a lot of this. He refers to a future profit picture. And so that's what it is. Uh, what, what you're seeing is a future profit picture going through the company. Everybody that can be attached to a value stream or a routing is on it. And that's, that could go all the way out to somebody that's doing customer engineering, whatever it is. If the work can be attached to a value stream, it's on it, and they are evaluated just as much as somebody on a shop floor. And so this, it becomes a total, a total system. Now, if you follow it, your profit pricing loss should be close to zero. In other words, don't take in work that you can't do or underprice or just take something on the hope that you'll figure out how to do it. Uh, particularly job shop type companies, that's a pretty common problem because people get concerned they're not taking enough work in, so they'll grab stuff that <clears throat> you may or may not be able to do very well. Or not at all, and then you got a real problem. Uh, and to Bill's point, you're tracking profit pricing on this map. You're tracking profit. It's a different concept from what we ordinarily have, which is sales minus cost. You get that in mind. The rest of it, if you're operationally experienced is pretty straightforward. By the way, this linkage is a big deal. Uh, amongst other people, Peter Drucker mentioned it like 15, 20 years ago, toward the tail end of his career, that there is a big split between operational data that you use to guide a company or to tell you what's going on. And the other one is an accounting system that is primarily financial and is intended to advise investors outside the company how well their investment's doing. And the difference between the two has all kinds of sim symptoms of it, but it's, it's a huge issue because... Uh, it's caused all kinds of conflicts between management and labor and banks and their customers. And, you know, 
uh, if you've been in companies very long, you've experienced it, and it's kind of a silent a silent gap that isn't addressed very well. You think about it, and an awful lot of other problems in the company come down to this one. Now, it isn't just a gap between finance and operations. It could be between marketing and others, too. If you're doing something, does the data you get really tell you very much about what you're doing and whether it's better or worse? Uh, we're kind of getting down to what I think is the key part of this. What does it get you to do because you engineer profit? That's a target. It's a different mindset. Profit may not be your only target. You may have all kinds of other objectives for the company, and you should. But everybody's got to make some money in this world. So wherever you set it, that's the money that you think you're going to get and you're setting up to go get it. <clears throat> uh, the second bullet point is that what insights do you get? Well, earned revenue per order, profit for each activity to got something that's, you know, cause people get into this all the time, are we losing money at this operation or not? You talk about profit for a Applied labor hour, not necessarily the cost burden of unapplied labor, etc. Bill refers to plan profit velocity. Key issue: if you increase the velocity of profit going through the company, that's where you get it. And so, as you plan this, you can increase the velocity, and you can adjust. What Bill calls a protect number, you adjust other things that have a financial readout, and it tells you as you're putting the squeeze on operations and getting it better, what's the financial result of this? It'll also tell you up front that you are releasing capacity because you're doing much better than you used to. And you can use it to say, here's what kind of infill sales we need to fill that unused capacity. When I've been around lean companies who are doing something similar, common problem was the, the, the senior management had little confidence that, that the release capacity was really going to appear or when. So they're way behind the curve figuring out what they were going to do for infill sales. Uh, well, maybe we can go on from this. Uh, that last one improved process improvements. Um, to, to the real core of this, <clears throat> because it's such upside down thinking, the software grabs our attention. It's not the important part. It's what you do with it that's the important part. And that gets us into the arena in which uh, Dwayne and Jim's webinars and programs frequently address. How do you make a company better? Well, if you're if you're really inheriting a mess, you need to stabilize first. Do you have basic operating disciplines? You don't need to start this if you I've actually been in companies where somebody's looking at how much money they had left in some budget and charge some other cost to it. You know, if you're all screwed up in transactional reporting, if inventory numbers are out of whack, if you've got big quality problems and deed resolution, you've got all kinds of things like that, or you got people that really are under trained and you got trouble, any of those things, you got to correct those to a point where the operation is stable. Then you're ready to begin on something like this. You can say the same thing about going into lean. You're not really ready to do much much of anything until the operation's stable. Last thing's really important. <clears throat> the management, the senior management, needs to really want to lead people toward better operating performance. 
if they're inclined to just coast or they want to run it their way or, or anything of the sort, and you're the general manager, you got to think about that because if they don't understand what you're doing and why and, and back you, you got a problem. It's sometimes called a career limiting move. Uh, what to do to change culture? Well, there are a lot of things. There's only five points on this slide. You don't need to fiddle around psychologically messing with people's minds very much. If you change what people do and you develop a system in which they can begin to have confidence, it mutes the conflict and and as people trust the system, they begin to trust each other. They start to become more of a we team, not uh, me. you and me. Uh, that third bullet point down, I've seen this any number of times, come up with an improved operational system but the HR policies don't change. Just take an extreme example. They want lean, but they still keep people on, say, piece part pay. Or Those policies may be easy to change. They may not be so easy to change. But if you're not aligning policies with operational improvement, however you label it, you're going to have a problem. Secondarily, it's, it's not totally Pollyannish. A uh, company of any size, you're probably going to have some obstacles. Some of them walk around on two legs. And unfortunately, that's part of life, too. They just can't make the turn at Albuquerque. Uh, last part is something that a good leader does. You personally set some examples to follow. You may not be an expert. You can't be an expert in everything that goes on in a company that's doing anything very complicated. But you can create examples that others can follow, and the change people tell them tell you that what you're doing is making new stories for everybody to tell that this is that describes. Here's how it is now. Doc, Bill here again. All the reporting systems in this process attack the what, not the who. They attack manufacturing methods, not people. That's what this thing aims at. Yeah, now, people that, you know, Bill's messed with this software thing for quite some time. He's had the comment before, well, the software doesn't work without Bill. So what's Bill? Well, Bill has, Bill learned manufacturing pretty much on his own. Uh, he came to the conclusion that a lot of other people do if they're around it and they got good sense. A lot of what we call excellence or lean or TQM or whatever is common sense if you're thinking about manufacturing and improving the, the quality and the flow. So Bill always starts with 5S. I, I think everybody kind of know what 5S is. And then housekeeping, or cleanliness. You got a dirty plant, clean it up. Bill mentioned the third point. Don't point fingers at people. Attack processes. Get everybody involved in solving the problems. Uh, intrinsically, some managers have difficulty doing that. They're so used to doing to managing their way. You don't have to be the brightest person in the room. SPC, statistical process control. And a discrepancy review committee. Uh, if you don't have it, then something that may be unique, a discrepancy pricing committee. If we screwed up pricing an order, why? And what are we not looking at that we ought to? Bill refers to preset tooling. And more generally, that, that means that the tooling for a machine shop is preset before the job begins and there's a flow of work to a tool room or tool repair or whatever that makes that happen. You're setting up a standard process and a flow everywhere it's important 
to keep the whole thing running. Uh, first part inspection, that's machine shops, stamping shops. In other words, in a more general sense, the responsibility for quality is at the source with the people doing the doing. If something goes wrong, well, their name's on it. Uh, another one, I've not seen this very often in lean presentations anyway. The, the, it's typified by building your own tooling in-house. That's all part of learning the processes essential to you absolutely cold. When you do that, you can fix, improve, change, modify, adapt. And now then, you're in charge of your own operational destiny. If, if something goes wrong with a machine, and you've got to call somebody who won't get there until tomorrow, you got problems. You have to uh, avoid that. And going back to good old days, when I first started driving, I could change a tire in 10 minutes, maybe 15 at the most. I haven't changed a tire now in about 20 years. And it gets complicated enough. What would you do in case of a flat tire? Well, in my age and shape, probably phone AAA. Well, that's a long way from getting out and being back on the road in 10 minutes. And doing all that adds to your resilience and flexibility as a company. The last one's operator instructions, up to date. They may help do that. There's no reason why they can't write their own. Uh, one of Bill's early magic potions was theory of constraints. Well, when you use the QPS software, it points to bottlenecks. Some of Dwayne and Jim's programs are on TWI, Training Within Industries. That's, that's a great way. Uh, if you don't know TWI, it was a four-step program and there's three stages to it but without digging into all that it was a training process widely used in World War II and then abandoned uh, largely because people running companies wanted to instruct workers they didn't want somebody outside or workers instructing each other the psychological part of this is just won't quit but if you got a company where you got aid OJT, on-the-job training, is going on all the time. you got cross-training. you got apprenticeships where it's appropriate. You're mentoring people. All that goes with it. Document the, re the outcome of problems. Problems and resolution documentation. If you're familiar with A3, that's a pretty good example of it. They have preventive and predictive maintenance. Uh, you used to judge manufacturing excellence prizes. This was an Achilles heel of a lot of them. Too much unplanned maintenance. Most of it should be preventive and predictive. Way up there, like 90%. Design for manufacturing. If you are characterizing what you can do, that's a big aid in figuring out what you need to do yourself or with your customers to design what you can do. Bill is big on gain sharing and gain sharing from operational results. Not from the P&L. You can have a lawsuit or something that affects your P&L that does not have anything much to do with what the people in the company, do, their performance, what they do. So Real gain sharing rewards them for the results that are easily attached to things they can affect. And now you got something that is a pretty good motivator. Next to last bullet point, Doc, flexibility I, is very Doc, yeah. Doc, I'd like yeah. to add into the gain sharing. The reason it's called that is you're being rewarded for improving the process throughput not the profit the throughput and then the profit is attached to that that's why it's called gain sharing 
you're gaining traction at the floor. Okay, uh, next to last bullet point, <clears throat> I realize these are big word slides, but the importance of flexibility in companies is all too often greatly underestimated. You're not going just for reducing the time flow through. You want to be able to do it flexibly. For example, I remember a company called Tokai Rika, great. They had a fourth of the plant space devoted to storing extra machines. They wanted to do something, if it was 12.30 and they wanted to be doing something by different on some cell, by 1 o'clock they'd wheel machines back, wheel other ones out, get it all set up and be going. That's flexibility. The companies that can do that react to the changes that are coming at them, and they're always coming. Uh, they react quickly, and that helps with the customer. And in addition, that's, that's your backup plan. All that equipment paid for and written off. Not obsolete, just paid for and written off. What does it cost you? Space. Uh, the last point is pay attention to developing employees, particularly uh, high performance or high potential ones. Standard term called high pots. This, this goes along with a company that is not trying to drive labor costs into the ground, but one that develops people uh, makes full use of their expertise and rewards them. And that ties in with gain share. Yeah. So Where's this that? is results from, I forget, about 23 companies you've tried this out in. Yes, sir. Many of them, Bill was uh, not just advising, he was the head schmuck. Uh, so when you began, on average, the companies were getting you know, 4.92, close to 5% profit. Percent of what, Bill? 17. What's that, sir? What's the percent based on percent of what? Uh, of sales of their, of their of sales and then you can see that within a year or two they were getting capital free profit and it went up to 17.3 percent well using these old numbers bill said look these companies required 29 percent infill sales to get that 17.3 percent they would have to do who knows what and jack up to almost four times new sales to get the same profit. Wouldn't be capital free, it's just, you know, you're, you're comparing apples and peaches. And to explain how, uh, how it worked and what he did, uh, Bill will just tell you a little story about what he did at one of the companies, Evergreen. At Evergreen, it was interesting, uh, uh, I was the plant superintendent, and he's my number one mentor. I was working for him, and this was a big uh, first-tier Boeing Aerospace shop, and he came to my office. I was plant superintendent. He said, do you like being plant superintendent? I said, oh, this is the greatest job I ever had. I got everything I want. And he said, good, because that's as far as you can go for usefulness with me. And I said, well, what am I doing wrong? He said, nothing. But what it was, he said, this company is made up of money, and you don't know anything about money. So I trundled back to the university and went through the executive MBA program, and it was there in 1983 that I discovered that I couldn't run the operations with gap P&L information. It didn't work. It couldn't fit. And that was the beginning of what's called the profit model and the QPS solution. It started there, and it's been evolving ever since, and it's now on the cloud available for any American manufacturing company. This will not go overseas. Uh, what did what did you do as a plant superintendent? You know, going going to work with people. What did you do? Well, what I did is we used the system 
to protect their performance. And so it, it, we were standing up for the shop and uh, it wasn't, it, it, administration couldn't drop the shoe on the shop. And what it did is it identified the key characteristics so that we worked as a team that what we call tap the what, not the who, tap menu. And we worked as a team to resolve these problems together. Yeah. Did you begin with five S, man? Yes, sir. That's when we implemented all of the structures that you saw in those two slides up there. And one of the things that was up there that talked about discrepancy review committee and profit review committee, those happened on the shop floor daily. The system is real time. And whenever a constraint showed up, it got identified in discrepancy review committee. We met every department there every day at one o'clock, assigned the department or the issue to correct in the cause and corrective action so that we could get the parts back in work and reducing. We were able to reduce sunk, what's classically called sunk costs, we call it sunk profit loss, to near zero because it was all real-time action. Summarize all that, we can do better using the last, maybe a lot less. This is the final slide, and we've got about 40 minutes. We've got questions. Yeah, uh, Doc and Bill, there are no questions that have come in, so appreciate you putting your contact information here where if anybody does have follow-up questions, they certainly can get a hold of Bill uh, at that phone number or email address. So yeah, if you got any, if you got any questions that are going into any depth, you got to get a hold of Bill. My my knowledge of what he is is secondhand and shallow. And Bill's been working about 30 years. He will take you for a ride through the screens and explain how it works, and you know more stories about what was done. And, uh, Bill tends to talk about the software. The key part. As I mentioned earlier, is not necessarily the software. It's what Bill did with it that made it work, and you can do that too. It's a guide to becoming a much better general manager. And what I discovered was because the whole system is designed around a full pull, it's from the front end of the company, not the back end. And when I was at GE, I started out as manager shop operations of the aircraft jet engine group. I ended up with component repair, specialty heating. It ends up allowing managers to run, be about 300% more efficient because it, the tail is not wagging the dog. You know where the problems are and you go and you're looking for them either real time or before the fact not after the fact. Well, Bill, uh, thanks for pioneering some of this thinking and Doc, thanks for helping to further explain it and kind of bringing us a new way to, to think of our business here. Dwayne, Bill again, we yes. want to be a part of helping to reshore manufacturing in America. Without manufacturing, America is in a lot of trouble and we want to be a part of that process. And I did just see uh, both Doc and Bill, I saw that you both uh, will be at the Lean Accounting Summit in Savannah here in just a couple weeks, right? I saw yes, your sir. registrations come through. Yep. Sure. All right. Good. Well, if you uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'd like to sit face to face with Doc and Bill, um, get more into their thinking behind this and uh, even take a test drive with Bill on uh, the QPS system, I'm sure they'd be happy to do so. Dwayne, I want to say my appreciation to Doc Hall. He's able to understand the attributes of this thing, and we need to really, really look at this to bring manufacturing back, you know, back to life 
and you're going to find that most of these principles came from the 30s and the 40s. Yeah, very much makes sense. Okay, gentlemen, well, I think for now we'll wrap it up then, and uh, we'll get the, uh, the third webinar scheduled, and we'll also see you down in Savannah. Thank you very Thanks, much. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, bye -bye. everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Dwayne. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye. Bye.